In this episode, I want to present the annotated Silver Blaze by Arthur Conan Doyle. Hi, I'm Rick Ryman, host of Audibly Speaking, a show on the stories behind the stories of our time. By sounding out on these stories, we give voice to them and hear them for the first time. From the news of the day to history and literature, from audiobooks to leaders on the stump, we examine the backstories of our time, audibly speaking. I'm a little bit tired of just narrating the Sherlock Holmes stories, so I thought that I would have an annotated version of one of the favorite Sherlock Holmes stories of all time, as most people would say, and that is Silver Blaze. Silver Blaze is a wonderful story that combines the best of Arthur Conan Doyle's many, many skills. And I will try to illustrate that by narrating Silver Blaze and departing from the narration from time to time to just pause and reflect on some of the most ingenious portions of this wonderful, wonderful story. One of the unusual additions to this story in the Conan Doyle canon is a horse race, the running of the once lost, now found, Silver Blaze, which Doyle writes with much verve and aplomb. Also not to be missed is one of the great lines in English literature, which comes and goes so quickly that it is easy to miss. That's the virtue of some television adaptations of Silver Blaze, of which my favorite is that which is portrayed by Jeremy Brett in the ITV series, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. In this version, the staging introduces the viewer to the barking dogs of the stable early in the story, where the horses at King's Pyland are kept. It's a bit of foreshadowing of the famous line, which foreshadowing is completely absent in the tale as written by Conan Doyle. Too bad, because you must not miss it. So there will be some punctuation in the narration. It's not going to be a smooth narration for that. You can go to my other recording on Silver Blaze, which is a simple narration of the story. But here we're going to have departures from the text from time to time to reflect upon some of the ingenious moments of this particular story. So it starts with these words. I'm afraid, Watson, that I shall have to go, said Holmes, as we sat down together to our breakfast one morning. Go? Where to? To Dartmoor, to King's Pyland. I was not surprised. Indeed, my only wonder was that he had not already been mixed up in this extraordinary case, which was the one topic of conversation through the length and breadth of England. Now, here's the first departure. Obviously, this is a made-up case. None of Conan Doyle's stories were like Antony Horowitz and Foyle's War, which is based on fact. But in the case of Conan Doyle, everything is made up. For a whole day, my companion had rambled about the room with his chin upon his chest and his brows knitted, charging and recharging his pipe with the strongest black tobacco and absolutely deaf to any of my questions or remarks. Fresh editions of every paper had been set up by our news agent, only to be glanced over and tossed down into a corner. Yet silent as he was, I knew perfectly well what it was over which he was brooding. There was but one problem before the public which would challenge his powers of analysis, and that was the singular disappearance of the favorite for the Wessex Cup and the tragic murder of its trainer. When, therefore, he suddenly announced his intention of setting out for the scene of the drama, it was only what I had both expected and hoped for. "'I should be most happy to go down with you if I should not be in the way,' said I. "'My dear Watson, you would confer a great favor upon me by coming, and I think your time will not be misspent for there are points about the case which promise to make it an absolutely unique one. We have, I think, just time to catch our train at Paddington, and I will go further into the matter upon our journey. 
you would oblige me by bringing with you your very excellent field glass. Now, of course, this is another standard trope in the Sherlock Holmes stories, where Sherlock Holmes invites Watson along on the case. In many cases, he needs Watson along for protection, and he asks Watson to bring his pistol. That is not the case here, but it is easy to see that Conan Doyle has gotten the story off to a rip-roaring start. He's wasted no time. Holmes and Watson are already on their way to the scene of a crime or a potential crime, and so the story is off and running, much like a horse race. And the famous Sidney Paget picture of Holmes and Watson sitting in a train car with Holmes explaining the case to Watson, of course, was based on Silver Blaze. And that scene occurs in this famous story. And so it happened that an hour or so later, I found myself in the corner of a first-class carriage, flying along en route for Exeter, while Sherlock Holmes, with his sharp, eager face framed in his ear-flapped traveling cap, dipped rapidly into the bundle of fresh papers which he had procured at Paddington. We had left Redding far behind us before he thrust the last one of them under the seat and offered me his cigar case. This is the only story, by the way, in which Holmes is depicted as wearing an ear-flapped traveling cap. He never is depicted wearing a deerstalker cap, which is what we tend to see images of Holmes portrayed as. But I guess this is the closest example of that in any Holmes story. We are going well, said he, looking out the window and glancing at his watch. Our rate at present is fifty-three and a half miles an hour. I have not observed the quarter-mile post, said I, nor have I. But the telegraph posts upon this line are sixty yards apart, and the calculation is a simple one. I presume that you have looked into this matter of the murder of John Straker and the disappearance of Silver Blaze. I have seen what the Telegraph and the Chronicle have to say. It is one of those cases where the art of the reasoner should be used rather for the sifting of details than for the acquiring of fresh evidence. The tragedy has been so uncommon, so complete, and of such personal importance to so many people that we are suffering from a plethora of surmise, conjecture, and hypothesis. The difficulty is to detach the framework of fact, of absolute undeniable fact, from the embellishment of theorists and reporters. Then, having established ourselves upon this sound basis, it is our duty to see what inferences can be drawn and what are the special points upon which the whole mystery turns. On Tuesday evening I received telegrams from both Colonel Ross, the owner of the horse, and from Inspector Gregory, who was looking after the case, inviting my cooperation. Now, this is a most unusual feature of a home story, and that is where Conan Doyle talks about what makes this particular case unique. And here he says, we've got so many facts to consider. It's not a question of trying to find things that are important out of nothing, it's having to take a wealth of information and whittle it down. So that's a very interesting and unusual problem for Holmes, and he's setting us up to try to figure that out. Tuesday evening, I exclaimed, and this is Thursday morning. Why didn't you go down yesterday? Because I made a blunder, my dear Watson which is, I am afraid, a more common occurrence than anyone would think who only knew me through your memoirs. The fact is that I could not believe it possible that the most remarkable horse in England could long remain concealed, especially in so sparsely inhabited a place as the north of Dartmoor. From hour to hour yesterday I expected to hear that he had been found, and that his abductor was the murderer of John Straker. 
When, however, another morning had come, and I found that beyond the arrest of young Fitzroy Simpson nothing had been done, I felt that it was time for me to take action. Yet in some ways I feel that yesterday has not been wasted. You have formed a theory, then. At least I have got a grip of the essential facts of the case. I shall enumerate them to you, for nothing clears up a case so much as stating it to another person, and I can hardly expect your cooperation if I do not show you the position from which we start. I lay back against the cushions, puffing at my cigar, while Holmes, leaning forward, with his long, thin forefinger checking off the points, upon the palm of his left hand, gave me a sketch of the events which had led to our journey. Silver Blaze, said he, is from the Isonomy stock and holds as brilliant a record as his famous ancestor. He is now in his fifth year and has brought in turn each of the prizes of the turf to Colonel Ross, his fortunate owner. Up to the time of the catastrophe, he was the first favorite for the Wessex Cup, the betting being three to one on him. He has always, however, been a prime favorite with the racing public and has never disappointed them, that even at those odds enormous sums of money have been laid upon him. It is obvious, therefore, that there were many people who had the strongest interest in preventing Silver Blaze from being there at the fall of the flag next Tuesday. The fact was, of course, appreciated at King's Island, where the colonel's training stable is situated. Every precaution was taken to guard the favorite. The trainer, John Straker, is a retired jockey who rode in Colonel Ross's colors before he became too heavy for the weighing chair. He has served the colonel for five years as jockey and for seven as trainer, and has always shown himself to be a zealous and honest servant. Under him were three lads, for the establishment was a small one, containing only four horses in all. One of these lads sat up each night in the stable, while the others slept in the loft. All three bore excellent characters. John Swaker, who was a married man, lived in a small villa about two hundred yards from the stables. He has no children, keeps one maidservant, and is comfortably off. The country round is very lonely, but about half a mile to the north there is a small cluster of villas, which have been built by a Tavistock contractor for the use of invalids and others who may wish to enjoy the pure Dotmore air. Tavistock itself lies two miles to the west, while across the moor, also about two miles distant, is the larger training establishment of Mapleton, which belongs to Lord Backwater and is managed by Silas Brown. In every other direction the moor is a complete wilderness, inhabited only by a few roaming gypsies. Such was the general situation last Monday when the catastrophe occurred. On that evening the horses had been exercised and watered as usual, and the stables were locked up at nine o'clock. Two of the lads walked up to the trainer's house, where they had supper in the kitchen, while the third, Ned Hunter, remained on guard. At a few minutes after nine, the maid, Edith Baxter, carried down to the stables his supper, which consisted of a dish of curried mutton. She took no liquid, as there was a water tap in the stables, and it was the rule that the lad on duty should drink nothing else. The maid carried a lantern with her, as it was very dark and the path ran across the open moor. Now, it's unusual in a Holmes story, but Holmes obviously has a great deal of information about the case, which he has gotten from the newspapers. So this is another unusual filigree for a story by Conan Ditt Doyle, where once again we are reminded that there is a great deal of information that is known about this case already, even at the outset of the story. Edith Baxter was within 30 yards of the stables when a man appeared out of the darkness and called her to stop. As he stepped into the circle of yellow light thrown by the lantern, she saw that he was a person of gentlemanly bearing, 
dressed in a gray suit of tweeds with a cloth cap, 